Hi, everyone. Great to see you all. We'll get started in just a moment. We're going to wait for folks to trickle in. We'll get started at 1.01. Thanks so much for joining. Okay, it's 101. We can get started. And as folks come along in, they'll just join us. But welcome, everybody. Greetings. If you're new to the LifeWay community and if you're returning, welcome back. It is so great to have you. Welcome to part two of our human trafficking and humanitarian emergency series. The context for today is that we are in the middle of a pandemic and we still haven't gotten out, quite frankly. On top of that, LifeWay was negatively impacted by Hurricane Ida. And this is concerning as there are more and more humanitarian emergencies occurring periodically. Recent years have shown an unprecedented amount of emergencies globally. The last 10 years, we have seen a rise in violent conflicts. There has been one natural disaster after the other from Hurricane Katrina to the fires out west to cyclones, you name it. And the COVID-19 pandemic is a reminder of the outbreaks and how long the lasting impacts can truly have. And there's no evidence that there's an end in sight. So we had a session two weeks ago that focused on the work published by the education department here at LifeWay Network, which surveyed secondary sources to describe the relationship between human trafficking and emergencies generally. And with that macro level overview, today's Lunch and Learn will focus on providing you with an update about how the Hurricane Ida emergency specifically impacted LifeWay. Today we have a special guest, Sabrina Zatoli, who serves as a social worker here at LifeWay Network to comment directly on this. And we'll have time for Q&A at the end. As a reminder, please put any questions that you have in the Q&A function. I do tend to not see them in the chat, especially because it's separated out. So I will definitely miss it, put it in the Q&A. We look forward to answering it at the end. Before we jump in, let me introduce myself. My name is Tori Corbello. I'm the Director of Education, Training and Advocacy. My career has focused on advancing human rights in various capacities. I was a briefer at the United Nations, was a research analyst for New York City's largest family homeless shelter, and my work has focused around advocacy on ending human trafficking, promoting fair trade, and supporting children's rights. Before coming to LifeWay, one of the organizations I worked for was UNICEF USA, an organization highly attuned to emergencies around the world. I also conducted a six-month internship with the International Rescue Committee, so I'm hypersensitive to the interaction of human trafficking and emergencies. My master's is in public health, so raising questions and challenging data is what inspired me to conduct the research for the Journal of Modern Day Slavery about the intersection of human trafficking and uh, humanitarian emergencies. Just a bit of background about LifeWay Network. LifeWay is the only provider in New York City to offer long-term safe housing for women survivors of all forms of human trafficking, including labor, sex, and organ trafficking. We service both domestic and foreign-born survivors. So whether the survivor experienced trafficking in the past or more recently, we understand that the healing process can take a while and at LifeWay, they're able to heal. We also provide education to the general public, as well as various groups of professionals from paramedics to law enforcement to hospitals and schools. So if your organization needs a training on human trafficking, absolutely reach out to us. We ensure that learnings from the safe house reach the public, and we do that to ensure that communities are not only able to identify trafficking, but prevent it as well. We also advocate for various policies pertaining to human trafficking. I sit on a number of coalitions and task forces, including the New York State Anti-Trafficking Coalition and the Brooklyn Task Force. And we meet with decision makers regularly around the issue. We also have a program called WINGS for Safe House alumni, where they're matched with a mentor. 
and build community and work towards various goals that they have even after their stay at Lifeway Network. But without further ado, let's get Sabrina into this conversation. So I'm very pleased to mention that Lifeway social worker Sabrina Zatoli is with us. Would you mind introducing yourself, Sabrina? Hi, everybody. Thank you so much, Tori. My name is Sabrina Zatoli, and I'm the licensed social worker. My background has been consistent with working in anti-trafficking and homelessness. I worked in South Africa and in Vietnam in the field of social work prior to completing my master's. When I returned to the States, I received my master's in trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy. I've been working with Lifeway Network the day New York City went on pause, March of 2020. I work in both safe houses, providing supportive counseling, workshops, trainings, and life skills. I'm certified in horticultural therapy, and this past season was able to build two vegetable and flower gardens in the safe houses with the survivors. Yeah, and you can check out some pictures of Sabrina supporting with the garden at Lifeway One on our social media. If you don't already follow us, I highly suggest you do so, so you can keep in touch with the various activities that we run. So that's one of my favorite things about Sabrina is that her passion for horticulture therapy and the gardening that she does with the survivors. Okay, so for the first question, Sabrina, as we know, one of Lifeway Safe Houses was recently impacted by Hurricane Ida with significant loss and damage to the property. Hurricane Ida was another unforeseen natural disaster coupled with the COVID-19 virus. What was Hurricane Ida like for the survivors and how have you had to adjust your practice as a social worker in order to meet the needs of the survivors? I always talk about how fortunate I am to work with this population. The resiliency of, the, of survivors of human trafficking is unbelievable. During the pandemic, they con continued to persevere despite the continued barriers and obstacles they previously faced. And even more now that everything was shut down or had limited access. When Ida flooded our safe house, they continued to lead with their resiliency. They reported to me that not having access to hot water at that time was okay, as they were used to showering with cold water. That was not something that I was thinking about. I processed that to reflect on my privileges, that these women look at a hot shower as a luxury. I adjusted my practices as a social worker to do check-ins with each resident every day to see how they were feeling physically, but also emotionally, and if they needed any further accommodations due to the storm damage that happened in the home. They continued on with their day-to-day -day despite other barriers. And when the hot water was fixed, they were very appreciative, but not once did they ever complain. It puts a lot into perspective when working with this population when it comes to needs and wants. Yeah, and just to visualize this a bit, I wanted to quickly show a few photos and videos knowing that I would ask you that question, uh, just to give the audience a sense of what we're talking about and the scope of it. Um, I know many people were affected, but absolutely to varying degrees. And it was quite significant in Lifeway One. So this is a video and this is just when the flood just started coming in. And here are some pictures of the final result. As you can see, it's pretty high from these photos. Um, and yeah, just astonishing. So this is the after effect of the video that we just showcased a moment ago. And I believe these photos are on our social media if you wanna check them out as we're, I'm gonna switch to the next slide. Okay, so Sabrina, Lifeway prides itself on being a trauma-informed environment in various different capacities from the top up, down. We try to incorporate it wherever possible with our trainings. So my question for you, and I think this is a really important one, is does the physical environment play into trauma-informed care or is, are we just talking about simply aesthetics? Is there an intersection with the two? Why? Are we trying to raise funds for this? And why are we so concerned about the aesthetics is kind of what I'm trying to get at with this question. 
A trauma-informed environment is not only about like the colors and pictures that are hanging on the walls. It's when you walk into the safe house and it feels like home. You smell a home-cooked meal. You see the survivors watching telenovelas with each other on the couch. You feel the warmth of the environment. It's important that um, to maintain this warmth with every survivor and staff who enters into the safe house. Most of our survivors don't speak English, but smiling isn't a specific language. It's universal. Body language is universal and we can communicate by open body energy to invite whomever to sit and share a meal, a funny story, or even a hardship that they might be having. A trauma-informed environment isn't always about the color painted on the walls. It's also about like the energy in the environment uh, that we create and we provide this opportunity for these women to stay in our safe house to begin their healing journey. Yeah, it's so important, just doing what we can to remove triggers from the environment. Some of them may have spent time in jail or just another situation that maybe aesthetically wasn't as pleasing. So I think that's, we try to replicate something very different at Life Free Network, an environment that's conducive to healing and not reminiscent of some of the more traumatic memories that they may have experienced, absolutely. And what's interesting, what in, I guess what's interesting and what I'm trying to get at here, let me know if you um, are kind of confused by this question, but so we just are still in the middle of a pandemic, which is one emergency. And now we're coupled with this second emergency, which was still, we're still kind of recovering, doing a lot better than we were before with this Hurricane Ida. Um, so can you speak to how you believe all these emergencies impact the folks that we work with? So, you know, we're in a crisis and Ida was a crisis within a crisis in the safe house. Um, and what I noticed was the survivors interacting more with each other during this time and staff. You know, the need for interaction was so important for their social skills and ability to feel safe. Um, you know, they would always ask questions on how they can help in the environment. And with Ida, like, how long is it going to take to fix the, the stuff that was needed to be fixed? Uh, having the insights gave them a sense of control and understanding of the environment. Um, and it also was important for their emotional well-being. Working with survivors, you realize rather quickly the strength of resiliency that they possess they have undergone some of the most traumatic experiences and yet they still persevere. It's admirable to work with this population. Some of the difficulties the survivors we work with, um, you know, are constantly faced with one barrier after the next. Now I'm not talking kind of about the obvious ones of the reasons why they're with us, um, but wanting to highlight some of the barriers and difficulties that came along with COVID-19. When the pandemic first hit, everything closed, and that included the court system. A lot of the women we serve are undocumented and awaiting papers. This delayed the process drastically. Another difficulty was maintaining employment that they might have already had. Since everything closed with no understanding of when things would go back to you know, quote unquote normal, they were expected to just sit in this unknown. This brought up memories of their trauma and at times was very re-traumatizing. If they didn't have work authorization, they couldn't work. If they couldn't work, they couldn't save for independent housing. It's one barrier after another. And another difficulty um, that they were faced during the pandemic, especially in the beginning, was their families. A lot of our survivors have children in their home countries. Um, countries that don't have the same access to resources that we are privileged to have. They rely on working to send money to their family and children. They were worried about the health of their families and the impact that the pandemic was having on them. These survivors are very connected to their families and speak to them all day long. And being thousands of miles away with so much unknown, you know, they felt defeated. But one thing I always say is, even though they have one barrier after the next, they never give up. 
They seek out their support systems, their resources, and they continue to move forward knowing that eventually everything will fall into place. Their path is never linear, but when they reach their goals, there's always a big celebration. I started as soon as the pandemic began here at Lifeway. It was a unique way to start a new job, to say the least. When the pandemic began, everything was so confusing and unknown, and we were taking it literally day by day. The survivors adapted so quickly to their everyday activities now within the house. I started to do puzzles and art with the women just to take up some time during their day to keep busy. I started to teach English to those whose classes were canceled. We cooked a lot of cultural meals and ate together. I tried to create as much consistency in the house since the outside world was so inconsistent. I know I've highlighted this multiple times throughout the lunch and learn, but the resiliency of these survivors is something to truly take away from this conversation. Despite all the hardships these women go through, they always kept a smile on their face, motivation to do and be better, and at the front, gratitude for being at Lifeway Network. That was something I was so impressed with, Sabrina, was when I came on board, because we roughly started at the same time, was how once the pandemic hit, Lifeway was still operating. Even as you mentioned, everything closed. We were I was attending task force meetings, and just one person after the other was like, sorry, we're not operating. We're switching to remote. Our legal services can't meet so on and so forth, you name it, all the intersectional services that our survivors require. Um, but Lifeway didn't once stop and maybe had to adjust here and there, of course, to different protocols, but you all went in there every single day in person. And that's how I knew coming into Lifeway, I was like, I'm in the right place because the value of continuity and to put the survivors first and not just completely panic and freak out um, shows a lot of resiliency in the organization. And it was really, really admirable to watch just to see how much we were able to really meet our mission. And even when we we're put to the test. Okay. And so I appreciate you sharing all of that. On a kind of different note, uh, I believe that these updates are really important for the LifeWay community. I believe that we're a community of concerned individuals who want to take action, who want to be part of the anti-trafficking movement and do so in a variety of different ways. And so I value every single audience member. I value every single one of our donors or people that sign up for trainings. And I think these updates are a really, really important part of cultivating that community sentiment. Um, so as, since you're a part of the community as a social worker, what is your favorite part to maybe inspire the folks here? Being a part of this community is an honor. I always thank the women for sharing their time and healing journey with me during their stay at Lifeway. The sense of community that they bring into this environment is warm and so inviting. And as much as I provide for these women as a social worker, they give back to me just as much. I learn different cultural norms, cuisines, traditions. We share so many laughs and memories with each other. Um, and we, we build trust over a year together. And that really makes us feel like a family. Awesome. So with that, I will wrap up with some ways that we can continue to take action. Thank you so much for those updates, Sabrina. I know that you've been very much a part of not just supporting the women, but also part of the just everyday logistics of making sure that um, everything is taken care of. So appreciate that so much. Um, I would like to suggest to you all as audience members ways that you can take action. If as I'm talking, you want to put any questions in the Q&A for Sabrina, we'll be happy to answer those. Um, but on the meantime, uh, here are a couple of ways that I would say that upon listening to this one, and if you attended the first Lunch and Learn, uh, ways that I would propose that you take action is one, looking into being a conscious consumer and how your purchasing practices impact society. 
So one way that I would propose more specifically than just being a conscious consumer is exploring fair trade. It's one of my favorite ways to take action. And we try as much as possible to also explore fair trade uh, when we're buying even in our office. So for instance, the coffee in our main office is fair trade certified. And what I mean by fair trade certified is a product or a commodity. It could be coffee, tea, home goods, apparel, you name it that's certified by a third party. And there's a few different entities and in regard to what entity in particular you should look for, just one of the main ones, it doesn't really matter just as long as it's a third party certifier, uh, such as Fair Trade USA, Fair Trade America, um, World Trade Organizations, another one, here's, uh, here's a few of the labels, this is uh, the World Fair Trade Organization, and this one's Fair Trade America. So that's an example of a label that you might see on a commodity. And what that communicates to you when you're going to the grocery store or Duane Reed or wherever you might shop, that that product was made by adhering to specific values. So one value is absolutely human rights, checking for child labor, for exploitative practices, ensuring that the artisan or farmer was paid a living wage, but also an environmental component. And I think as we're thinking about natural disasters and how climate change will impact that, especially with climate change refugees and so on and so forth and the intersection there, I think not only thinking about how we can support the world's humans, workers, people, but also the environment is just as important. And sometimes we make decisions that are beneficial to one, but not the other. And I think it's important to think holistically about both sides of the coin. And I think fair trade does a good job of trying to think about all those aspects. There's so much that's represented in a fair trade product. I just listed some of the values, but it makes it very easy by just putting a label on a product so that you just in the store can just look out for the product and know that um, it was made with values in mind. And I started my fair trade journey a couple of years ago and it's just become second nature to me to find fair trade products to know where to go. Um, and I already am very familiar with what kind of products are fair trade. So for instance, Ben and Jerry is one of the most common examples of a fair trade certified product. So that's one way that I would suggest that you take action. I also urge you to give today if you haven't already. I know many of you have contributed. Um, you can go to our webpage at lifewaynetwork.org to contribute, but also we have an Amazon wish list. And that's a great way to support with any in-kind donations. That's anything specifically that we might need to replenish the house that was destroyed in the bottom. So there's a variety of different items. One might speak to you. And there's a list of different price ranges. You can find one that suits your budget. We'd appreciate it so much. Our next Lunch and Learn is scheduled for January, which is Human Trafficking Awareness Month. And we are excited to launch our second campaign, Shed Light HT. Uh, during January, we'll have not only a Lunch and Learn, but so many different activities. I am already creating the blueprint for it and very excited to join forces with you all to be a part of the movement. So with that, I think we have one question, Sabrina, and it's about coping mechanisms. I'll try to summarize, but essentially it's how do you find that the women tend to cope with situations of stress? I think such an important aspect of the work that we do here in the safe house is empowering the women to be able to um, communicate their needs in a very like healthy, healthy manner. Um, so one thing that I've noticed is reaching out to their support systems, whether it is their therapist that they will seek out for um, assistance when they're stressed or the staff here, um, but also reaching out to each other and creating that relationship with each other of the other survivors in the house. Awesome. Okay, so one final take action that I have before I conclude, and this one, I don't want it to be taken lightly, but it's spreading the word about Lifeway Network, and I'll tell you why in a second, but that's 
following us on social media, sharing our content on your stories, even forwarding the newsletters. If you're not subscribed, subscribe. But if you're already subscribed, forwarding it on to one or two people so that they're a part of the community as well. We pay very close attention to the content that we put out, especially with our blogs. We try to create very relevant and um, important analysis on various issues. So bring others into that. It takes two seconds to like, share, promote, but it makes a huge difference because what we're trying to do here is create awareness and prevent human trafficking wherever possible. So we need as many people as we can to know about uh, various human trafficking issues, subject matters, advocacy updates, you name it. So with that, we appreciate you all for attending. And on behalf of everyone from Lifeway Network, have a great rest of your day. Bye, Sabrina. Have a good one.